How you doing, Mitchell? Good to see you guys. Amen. Genesis. I, you know, when I, when I started walking through this message, I started realizing just how much providence played a part in my life. Today's message is the providence of detours. Amen. That when God gives detours, he has a reason for it. And you are to stay steady on it. We taught on it on Tuesday night and Wednesday night. We've been walking through the life of Joseph. We'll be in Genesis 43. And, uh, and I'm going to read more scripture this morning than what you're used to because we're going we're gonna to kind of rapidly move through this. But remember, Joseph was a young boy. He was 17, and he had a, what, a coat of many colors. Amen. His dad made for him. Favor follows whoever's favoring the father. Amen. And somehow Joseph favored his father, Jacob, and Jacob loved him. And I uh, loved him more than the other brothers, and that brought in a jealousy. And sometimes that happens among siblings. You know that as a sibling. If you don't want that, just have one child. Uh, speaking of that, today is my oldest son's birthday. Josiah is 29 years old. My goodness, 29. I remember going to Tinker Air Force Base and adopting him when he was just born. It was in a, uh, another miracle as our second child. Uh, get adopted, so... Thank God for his life. Love him. Of course, he hangs out with me. You don't get to see him much. He, he's more of a recluse, and I don't say that to pick on him. I tell you that's just who he is. He just he doesn't always like people. Uh, yeah, that's called a, a child of a pastor. Amen. Maybe he's seen some things, and, uh, and he, but he's getting over all that, doing well. I love him. So I thank God for his life. and. The love I've had for him for all these years, vice versa. He even bought me a gift yesterday. I'm shocked. On the other side now, Joseph, 17 years old, thrown in a pit by his brother. One brother said, let's don't kill him. Let's sell him. What was that brother's name? Judah. They sold him for how much? Eight ounces of silver. Amen. Just check and see if you remember this. And as he moved through life, he went from the pit. He was sold to the Midianites into the Midianites' life. He had a dream, though, and that's what got him in trouble. He dreamed a dream that his brothers would bow down to him and that his mom and dad would bow to him. His dad rebuked him about sharing that dream. Sometimes you got a dream, you don't want to share it with everybody, particularly if it's something that may sound a little condescending. And when you're young, you don't always know how to speak or say things. Hopefully, as you get older, you're not condescending and speaking down to people. So Joseph moves through life, and he ends up in a, a, a sold to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar's wife put a move on him, trumped up charge. He ended up in prison. Amen. They're in prison. He's 17. Now he's 30 years old. While he was in prison, he met two people, a baker and a cupbearer. The cupbearer was, uh, was told that he would get his job back working for Pharaoh and that the baker would get decapitated. It happened. Amen. But he asked him, Joseph said, please, sir. He didn't say it to the baker because he knew what was going to happen to the baker. But he said it to the cupbearer. He said, hey, dude, when you get out of here, Make sure you tell them that I was incarcerated wrongly and that uh, I need help. Two years later, everybody say two years? Two years later. So it happened this way. And again, we don't know how long you're on a detour. You don't know how long you're going to be going down rough roads. But he, it's two years later. But he is inside there, and God is favored. This is a blessing. God favored him while he was in jail. And that, that's huge, man. So he became the head trustee. And then when he, uh, the Pharaoh finally dreamed a dream, and of course, this is the second Pharaoh. This is not the one that started 13 years ago. That's something to keep in mind. These Pharaohs, they're all called Pharaohs, but they keep, you know, one dies and one pops in. So here's the other Pharaoh, and he looks at him, and he has a dream. And he dreams about seven cows, that, that fat cows that get, get ate up by seven skinny cows and seven big stalks of corn that get uh, devoured by seven uh, skinny corn, amen, and popcorn. and and anyway, on this side over here, so he comes uh, to Pharaoh says, I, man, I got to have, have somebody answer the dream. The magicians couldn't do it. Man's wisdom is useless in a detour. You don't know why you're in a detour. You don't know why you're doing this or why you're going through detours in life, but it happens. Amen. And when you try to figure it out on your own wisdom, you're in trouble. Uh, you, you just got to stay on the road. No matter how rough it gets, you just stay with it. Amen. So he just stayed with it, and he gets out, and he interprets it for Pharaoh Joseph does, and next thing you know, he is promoted because the Pharaoh believes him. Now, Pharaoh's dream, and we're talking about providence now, has everything to do with Joseph's dream. Joseph's dreams will not come true unless Pharaoh has a dream. 
So sometimes we're connected that way. But now we're, we're looking at 13 years later, and we have this dream. Now, I want to mention to you, our goals this morning as we walk through this is to define the providence of God in such a way that believers will understand that there's no such thing as luck, fate, karma, or chance. I'm going to say it again. Our goal this morning is to help all of us understand that there is no such thing as luck, fate, karma, or chance. If this was preached 70 years ago, there would be no Las Vegas. Can I get an amen? Amen. So, okay, I just want you to know that. Our second goal is to demonstrate that God uses both the good and the evil that people do in his well-orchestrated plan of fulfilling his destiny for our lives. In other words, God works good and evil for you. And even if you do evil, if you do wrong, you might get a penalty against you, but I'm telling you, God somehow will work that for your good if you'll stick with God. Amen? Next one. Our third goal is to encourage believers that although they cannot see everything that God is doing in the background, even when I don't see him working, even when I don't feel that he's working, they can trust that he is faithful to get us to the place that he wants us to be. Amen. I believe that heaven and earth is separated by this corridor called death, and we shouldn't be as afraid of it as we are because they are connected. Amen. That God has a plan for us in heaven, in the kingdom. He has a plan for us here. His providence is to get us there. But then this thing will continue. You only may have 25, 30, 40, 50 years, 70, 80 years here, but eternity is going to be a long time. Amen. You, you can't even count it. Matter of fact, the Scripture says there'll be no night there. So in understanding that, I walk through life here, and I say, now, God, show me some providence. Now, I'm going to allow you to stay seated as you're taking notes, but we're going to move into Genesis chapter 43, verse 28. Joseph's brothers are speaking to him now. Now, now, now the drought has hit. Now the uh, few years ago, drought hit uh, this property here. And, I mean, now that we're at the ranch, our ponds dried totally up. They cracked. Trees were falling over. It, it was, and it only happened once. For seven years, they're now in a drought. They've saved up for seven years. They, they've prepared themselves for it. But now people all around them are having to go to Egypt to get food. Now the brothers have hit a place. They don't know Joseph's alive. They, as far as they're concerned, he's dead. So they're on their way to go find out if they can get some food. When they get there, the Scripture says, then they said, yes, your servant, our father, is quite well. The question was asked about their dad. Very much alive. And they again bowed respectively before Joseph. Then Joseph picked out his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son. Now, Joseph, again, there's many mothers, but the mother of Joseph is also the mother of Benjamin. So this is his real blood brother. Okay, you follow me? And he's a younger. He's the youngest. So he's just now meeting him. His own mother's son, he asked, and is this your youngest brother that you told me about? Then he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved on seeing his brother and about to burst into tears. Again, they don't know who Joseph is. Joseph hurried out into another room, and he had a good cry. He just began to weep, man. Then he, wa I mean, he's got to be thinking, I can't believe this is happening. Here I am running the Egyptian economy, and my brothers have all showed up. What is God doing here? Again, we're looking at providence, deeply moved. Then he washed his face, got a grip on himself, and said, let's eat. Joseph had, was served at the private table, the brothers off by themselves, and the Egyptians off by themselves. Why? Egyptians won't eat at the same table with Hebrews. It's repulsive to them. Everybody understand racism been around a long time. So he was repulsive to them. The brothers were seated facing Joseph, arranged in order of their age from the oldest to the youngest. They looked at one another, wide-eyed, wondering what would happen next. Then, when the brothers' plates were served from Joseph's table, Benjamin's plate came piled high, far more so than his brothers. And so the brothers feasted with Joseph, drinking freely. Now, that, that's a little hint there. That favor follows whoever's favoring the father. Now, Joseph, he hadn't met Benjamin except right now, but he piles his food up. When I was reading about Benjamin, I have a son named Judah Benjamin. Named him that way for a reason. Sometimes you name a child something, they don't live up to it. But the word Benjamin means ambidextrous wolf boy. An appetite that can't be satisfied. That's Benjamin. Amen. The Benjamites are able to fight with left hand or right hand. This is, where, this is their tribe. 
Amen. So all of these became tribal leaders, if you would. So he piled Benjamin's up. Now, they had to look at him and go, what in the world is he doing piling Benjamin's plate up like that? You know, as I do, if you go to a buffet and somebody just gives you a little bit of food, they, they fix in their food, your food for you, and then one of them gets a big pile, somebody's favorite over the rest. Mm. I'm going to keep moving here. So now they slipped a silver cup into Benjamin's bag. So when they left, they stopped them and searched them. When they found that cup, they sent Benjamin, they brought him back to Joseph. You follow where I'm going here? So now Joseph has control over the youngest son of Jacob. When that happens, Joseph did it on purpose. Then we find Genesis 44, 27. I'm going to keep moving. You're serving my, so they tell the daddy that Benjamin has, has not come back home. And your servant, my father, told us, you know very well that my wife gave me two sons. One turned up missing, Joseph. I concluded that he'd been ripped to pieces. I've never seen him since. If you now go and take this one and something bad happens to him, you'll put my old gray grieving head in the grave for sure. So Jacob, he's he looking like you, Doug. Amen. He's gray-headed and heading, heading, heading south. Amen. So, so here he, we find that he's, he's discouraged. He's a little bit sad. Then we get into Genesis chapter 45, verse 1. Joseph couldn't hold himself any longer. He got all the boys out in front of him. Keeping up a front before all his attendants, he cried out, leave, clear out, everybody leave. So he kicked all the Egyptians out except for his brothers. So there was no one with Joseph when he identified himself to his brothers. But his sobbing was so violent that the Egyptians couldn't help but hear him. The news was soon reported to Pharaoh's palace. Joseph spoke to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father really still alive? But his brothers couldn't say a word. They were speechless. They couldn't believe that they were hearing and seeing. Come closer to me, Joseph said to his brothers. They came closer. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold in Egypt. Amen. But don't feel badly. What? Don't blame yourselves for selling me. God, but it was just good luck. It was just, it was fate. It was karma that brought me into this place today. Uh-uh, uh-uh. See what you're doing when you say that? You're taking the glory away from God. Amen. You're taking, because he's king of, he's Lord of. And when you say that, you mean that. So when you say it, mean it, and watch what, uh, anything else you're going to say that would take or pull anything away from him and be detriment. He, he said, don't feel badly. Don't blame yourself for selling me. God was behind it. God sent me here ahead of you, amen, to save lives. Now, Genesis 45, 25. They left Egypt, and they went back to their father Jacob in Canaan. The boys went back. And when they told him, Dad, Joseph is still alive, and he's the ruler. You ain't going to believe this, Dad. You ain't going to believe this. You wouldn't believe the luck. I'm talking like I've heard people talk. You ain't going to believe this, Dad. Hey, remember, Joseph is still alive, and he's the ruler over the whole land of Egypt. He went numb. He couldn't believe his ears. But the more they talked, telling him everything that Joseph had told them, and when he saw the wagons, see what Joseph did is he filled up all the wagons with, with goodies, amen, grains. He packed them to the, he said, I want you to bring my daddy the best. I want you to bless my daddy. Sometimes I stand back here and I say, man, the wagons are coming. Amen. I believe the wagons are on their way. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. Gas is three fifty a gallon now. Amen. Milk done jumped up to four fifty. Amen. You can't buy beef. It's four dollars for a, a pound of hamburger meat. You don't. I still say the wagons are coming. Amen. Our economy is based on God, not on what's going on in this world. Amen. So I'm just going to depend on Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's what He does. I mean, we're still talking about a time of famine, and here come the wagons here. But the more they talked, telling him everything that Joseph had told them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him back, the blood started to flow again. There it is. Their father Jacob's spirit was revived. In other words, he just he was like a shriveling up old man on his way out. But as soon as he got good news, somebody say good news. 
Amen. Everybody here carries the good news. When you tell somebody good news, the blood starts flowing again. Amen. You get the blood stirring again. Next thing you know, you got life again. And he just come alive. He got excited. You know, sometimes you got to have a reason to keep living. If you run out of a reason to live, if you run out of hope, it's over. You got to give yourself a hope for tomorrow. You got to give yourself a hope for next week and next year. Amen. Uh, for, for many of us, of course, it's grandkids. Amen. For Dave Clark, it's a Harley. Amen. Whatever it is. Amen. Make sure you got a reason to keep going. Can I get an amen? Amen. Their father, Jacob's spirit revived. Israel said, I, I've heard enough. Israel, the same thing as Jacob. I've heard enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I got to go and see him before I die. Now, we're at our text. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. All that was to get y'all here. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father had died. Now, now he has passed away. He's met his son. Amen. They've greeted. They've loved. Amen. But now he's passed away. They said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So there's an admitting we did wrong. Amen. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Now, I went back, and I tried to find where Jacob said, Make sure, boys, that Joseph forgives you. I couldn't find it. So here is a little bit of manipulation again. Here's a little bit of fear and trepidation again. The boys all thought, you know, now that daddy's dead, we ain't got a trump card. Amen. He's he going to kill us for sure. So they, they kind of manipulated him and said, you know, daddy said it would be good for you to forgive us. We were talking in the back. I have got to an age, you know, I'll be 61 here uh, um, Tuesday. And, uh, so uh, J-Bo told me this week, he said, Pastor, your head done wore out two bodies. You, you, just, you just, you know, you've been through and gone through and done things and stuff. But the bottom line is, is I get a little more forgetful. And, and, and Josiah had bought some equipment back here, and he said, I said, what are you doing? He said, I ask you. Okay. It sounds like my wife. She, she will, she'll do that. She'll say, well, I ask you if I could buy that. And I bought it, and I say, okay, because I don't remember, but I don't want to get myself in trouble by saying that you didn't ask me, but I'm at that age here where I don't remember everything. And so I almost have to write it down, right? I almost have to have other people write, write it down, and, I, and if I sign it, then, then I'll know it's good. How many know that ain't going to work either? They're not going to sign nothing. So, he, so here, Joseph's brother said, man, we, we got to tell him that daddy said. Now, this is the great thing about Joseph. He didn't care whether daddy said. Because in his heart, he already made up his mind not to live in bitterness about what had happened to him over the last 22 years. He'd been on a detour. He had been down this road before. and so. But Joseph said to them, and this is powerful, do not be afraid. For I am in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about the present result to preserve many people alive. That is powerful. You meant it for bad. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Verse 21, so therefore don't be afraid. I will provide for you. I'll provide for your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now, Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Makar, the son of Manasseh, were born of Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham, which is the promised land, right? Amen. Isaac. And to Jacob, when Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed, amen, and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Listen, whenever I read all this to you, 
you see the hand of God. You see the hand of God working through at 17 years of age into the prison, amen, from Potiphar's house into the prison, into, the, into Pharaoh's court, taking care of his brothers. It's the hand, it took years, but the hand of God never stopped. Even when I didn't see him working, even when I didn't feel him working, he was working. So when we use words like luck, chance, karma, faith to describe things that seem to happen without a purpose or explanation, the problem with using words like these is that they fail to acknowledge a larger truth that God is completely sovereign, which means that his rule affects everything and everybody. So I want to make sure that God gets the glory for everything that happens in my life. Amen. When I pray, I believe he's doing something. I'm not looking to scratch off. Uh, you know, listen, if you play scratch offs and lotteries and things like that, don't call it luck when you win. Don't call it chance when you win. Amen. Don't do any of that. Just give God the glory and make sure we get 10%. So it's not to say, listen to me, it's not to say that God, that the Lord does evil, nor does he approve of it. He doesn't. However, he uses it. He said here, he uses it. The evil that happens because of the actions and decisions of human beings gets used for ultimate good. God's plan provides each of us with a great degree of freedom. God gives us this freedom in this life. It's called grace, amen, and to include the freedom to do good. We can do good or we can do bad. It's our call how we do it. Rather than simply prevent us from doing it, amen, he took our evil intentions and he'll use them to fashion a greater destiny for each and every one. When I'm standing with a band, when I'm standing with the men yesterday when we cut in trees and the day before, I realized that God brought all of us together. It was providence. It was providence. I've known Travis since he was a little bitty boy. Amen, it's providence. Maybe I played golf with age. We've had things happen. We said, man, what's a, somebody said a coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. Amen. I'm going to just tell you, I, I've seen too many things realize that God has been involved in my life since the very beginning. Before I got born again, he was jacking with me. Amen. Messing with me. Always, he just, I can look back and say, Lord, you have never left me. You had your hand on this Wheeler Mountain boy. Amen. Since the very beginning. And I promise you, if you'll look at your life, under the microscope of the Word of God, you'll see that God has had, had intention on you. He's done things. Even when you detoured, amen, went down wrong roads, there he was bringing you back. So listen, providence is the way God arranges things to achieve his purposes. Sovereignty, it's a big word, but as it relates to God, has absolute rule and control over everything created. God is everything he created. He never backed off of him and said, all right, God will take care of it. No, he sends angels. He sent his son. He's always actively involved. Amen. When you pray, he hears you. You're getting an answer. It's yes. Sometimes it's very seldom as it may be. Amen. Got to get an amen? So providence establishes all activity as both under the rule and part of his design. God sustaining and guiding human destiny, both big and small. God's involved in it because God is sovereign. He arranges all things for his purpose. When I'm preaching this and, and, and working through this in my mind, I'm thinking about Jesus and when he came to earth and all the things that God set up. He set it up through, through Joseph, uh, amen, and got Mary, the, the virgin, and, and he brought the angels in, and everything was done in such a design and such a time, amen, providence. Now, sometimes we can get upset with God. We don't understand it all. We see, you know, somebody passed away or this happened. I, I got to tell you, why are we shocked? Why are we shocked when somebody that we love passed away? Why aren't you shocked when somebody you didn't like passed away? Huh. See, love got everything to do with it. Can I get an amen? So when they pass away, it, 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 it affects us, yes. But that's what I'm telling you. There's not a lot of difference between heaven and earth. It's just a portal. Amen. It's just, it's just letting us in. Somebody said, that's Peter at the gate. I never read that it was Peter at the gate. Amen. I don't know why they say that. I don't care who's at the gate as long as I got to pass. Hallelujah. So God uses both the good and the evil that humanity commits to achieve his will and bring about his present results. And as I'm walking through this, I was telling my pastor about this message this morning. I said, Pastor, my problem, my problem, I got a problem. I got a problem. God uses both the good and the evil that humanity commits to achieve his will and to bring about his present results. Maybe this is where I say it again. It's not God sin, it's God used. Because what Hitler did was evil. 
What Stalin did was evil. Abortion is evil. As I walk through life, I see all this evil. I say, God, how? I'm just going to have to back off and trust you. Because I, I, I can't figure out some of this evil. But the evil that's happened in my life, amen, the evil that I've, I've done, the evil that I've allowed, amen, the, the people that I've pastored that have struggled with evil. God, I don't want to understand it all, but I back off and I say, Lord, I, I know you. You are God. Amen. My human wisdom, I can't figure out this detour all the time. I just got to stay on it. Amen. Until I hit a smooth road. Can I get an amen? Amen. And I, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I'm in God's place. As for you, you mean evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about his present result to preserve many people's lives. I got to tell you that quit questioning God's providence in your life. Accept it. You say, God, however you got this. But you know most of the things that we got in our life came from our own choices anyway. Amen. We chose it. Amen. We chose for this to happen. When it happened, then we had like we shocked. Amen. I was driving too fast. That's why it happened. Amen. I, I, I watched too many episodes of Dukes and Hazard and slid the car around the curve. It's my bad. I shouldn't have been in that gremlin. Nobody that loves God ought to drive a gremlin. But I did. And I slid it right off in a field. Whose fault? My fault. Amen. So while we may find, find life complicated and difficult to navigate, the foundation of it all is that God is sovereign. He's, he's in complete control. Number three, God has made restrictions or rules, but within those restrictions, we've been given great freedom. You know, our freedom means that we can make a choice. When we choose to violate God's restrictions, just like in sports, there's a penalty, a flag thrown associated with a violation, whether it's judgment against sin or consequences for bad choices. But even when we choose evil, God is sovereign. He'll work it out for your good if you come back to him. Amen. He, all you got to do is say, God, forgive me. That's why I look at Joseph, and Joseph said, guys, look, I know what you did, but I'm in God's place. I can have you all executed right now, but I'm going to tell you something. What you meant for evil, God turned it for good to the saving of many people. So I'm going to say right now, I'm just going to turn my life over to him and say, God, you, you take control. Amen. Forgive. Listen, back, uh, let's go back on Pharaoh. After this, Moses, right? We got Moses fixing to leave the promised land. I mean, head to the promised land. You remember, he went south. Took him 40 years. His detours were amazing. But that Pharaoh, another Pharaoh, again, we just, we're clicking through Pharaohs here. Uh, that Pharaoh chased after Moses. This is what the Scripture says to that Pharaoh, that God hardened his heart. You ever read that? You ever said to yourself, well, hold on. Pharaoh didn't have a chance. God hardened his heart. Amen. God made him that way. Ah, right, if you back up and read it, first Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Amen. And as he hardened his heart, in order for things to get done, God just allowed his heart to get hardened. That's why I use this phrase, the same sun that softens the butter, hardens the clay. If your heart is already hard, this preaching this morning is going right over your head and making you mad because I just licked the red off your sucker when I told you you shouldn't say the word good luck anymore. You're going to bite your tongue next time you say, well, karma just bit you in the, amen. Now, next thing you know, you know, you're mad and upset over the, because your heart's hardened. But if your heart's soft, you go, oh, that's a good word. That's a good word. He's right. I had not been giving God the glory. I've been giving luck and chance and Vegas all the glory. Mm-hmm. Or your local Exxon where you buy your stuff. Even when Satan goes after Job, 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 according if you're English or Hebrew. When Satan goes after Job, the Scripture says he still needs permission to do it. God said, I, I, I'll give you, I, I'm going to let you. The, the, you remember the story, a scenario like this. God and, and Satan meets and Satan says, you know what? <clears throat> if you allow me, I can make him cuss you. I can make him uh, walk away from you. And God said, he won't do it. I know that boy. He should just back off. And he said, all right, but you can't take his life. You can do it, but the boundaries have his life. Okay. So what happened? His children are dead. His economy is destroyed. His body is wrecked with, with, with disease. He's sitting in a heap. 
His friends are there. Amen. His wife says, why don't you curse God and die? I, that's always been my problem. Out of everything that, that the devil took, why did he leave Sister Job? More punishment, I guess. I guess just more punishment. Amen. So, so it's, just, it's just downhill for Job. Amen. So, man, and watch what Job, watch what he says here. Again, we cannot see all the intricacies of God's providential work. Even when it seems like he's not doing it, even when it seems like he's not working, even when I don't see that he's working, amen. Job 23, verse 8 says, Behold, I go forward. Go forward. But he's not there. I, I reach back. I can't perceive him. I can't find him. But on the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him, he hides himself on the right hand, and, and I, I I cannot see him, but he knows the way that I take. And when he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job said, you know what? This is a test. of the emergency broadcast system. And all I got to do is bear down under this test and not curse God and not be upset because he has providence over it. Well, it looked to me, Job, like you have a lot of bad luck. I said, well, you say whatever you want, but I think God's still in control. Amen. I want to give him control over this. When Job bounced back, he bounced back big. Amen. He came back prosperous. He came back blessed. He came back with children, amen. He came back with livestock. He came back with finances, and the devil got a black eye. Amen. I got to start closing here. Joseph cannot see all that God is doing, but he recognizes that all that had happened to him was for God's greater purpose. God connects every act of every person with his plan in order to accomplish his destiny. I don't know what destiny God has planned for you, but he brought you here this morning for a reason. Amen. He brought you here to understand that this is not a sermon against good luck, bad luck, <clears throat> but had no luck at all. Gloom, despair, agony on me, deep, dark, excessive. That just came back over me. That was from Hee Haw, 1973, right there. I promise you. <laughs> is that right, H? Amen. I remember that when I was a kid. And that's, that's the way I was brought up. Everything was good luck, bad luck. You know, you just you have to. I didn't realize how much God was involved in our lives and how much he wanted to do in our lives. See, hear me. What shocks us was known by God all along. What shocks us was known by God all along. God has never been surprised. God has never said, oops, didn't see that one coming. Missed that one. I, I didn't know they were going to turn left when I had them on the detour. Didn't know they're putting that car in the ditch. I didn't well, mess that one. See, God is sovereign. Nothing happens outside of his rule. But within that sovereignty, he created freedom, which means we get to choose. And you're free to say yes to God or no to God. I told somebody this week, they said they're mad at God. And I said, well, cuss him. He said, excuse me. I said, go ahead and cuss him. That's what you want to do anyway. You want to scream at the heavens. And flip him off. And shake your fist. Go ahead. He's big enough to handle it. The question is, will that help you get over it? Will you be all right afterward? Are you going to realize that God is sovereign? God is always going to do what God wants to do. But I want to tell you this. Some of the greatest words I ever heard in my life were, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. When I read this book, I realize God has never intended to hurt me. That was never his intention. Amen. Correct me, yes. Discipline me, yes. But he loves me. He loves me too much to hurt me. He's too wise to make a mistake. Your mind can't comprehend him. That's why I say evolution is such a damnable practice. It's terrible. There's no way. This thing happened by chance. 
You are God's design. From the hair in your nose to your pink, pinky toes, you are God's design. Created you such. Loves us. And has had a plan for us. Somebody said, is, this, is, it a, is there a perfect will of God? Is there a permissible will of God? Is it? I don't care. <laughs> Can I tell you? I don't care. Because I promise you, if there's a perfect will of God, I missed it a long time ago. And if there's permissible, oh, Jesus, then it ain't been as good as I thought it was. I mean, I just want to live for God. Just want to serve God and see what happens. When luck or its siblings, chance, fate, happenstance, or embraced as something to rely on, you call upon or hope for, you have now created an idol because luck becomes the thing that you're looking toward in making things work out for you. I don't need luck. Luck? Well, Pastor, you wrecked your bike, slid it down 2100, popped up, came over here and preached. Well, that was luck. No, it wasn't. Does God want me to show up up here and preach to y'all? Amen. What luck? Ain't no luck about it. I can tell you what else it was. It was skill. I've been riding scooters since I was 12. That scooter going down, I shoved it away from me, and I just slid my butt on the asphalt. Amen. Pop rock back up like Jack in the box. Amen. Well, you may not be so lucky next time. Is that right? Knuckleheads. See how we think? I don't, will there be a next I don't feel there'll even be a next time. Amen. I may never lay another bike down the rest of my life. Well, be careful when you're on that bike. That ain't why I ride. I don't ride to be careful. I don't ride to be safe. I ride because I like to feel the wind and the hair that I still have. Kenny? I ride because I like the curves. I drive my car fast at proper times because I like speed. I rode my horse fast. My horse put me in the hospital. My bike and car hadn't. I don't ride horses no more. They're bad providence. <laughs> Many people are trying to luck their way to heaven. Just trying to luck their way there. Luck their way into their destiny. Hoping that enough positive forces, good vibes, good vibes to you. Good, hey, I'm sending good vibes. How now do you send good vibes to people? Somebody answer that question. I'm sorry. Hold on. How do you send good vibes to people? I'm just gonna vibe. I'm gonna give you a good vibe. I didn't feel it. I ain't getting it. Still sick. How about you ask Jesus to heal me instead of sending me good vibes? You can pull your toes back in now. But I see that. We fall victim to this kind of language and kind of mentality. We're not, we're not Bible thinkers anymore. Amen. This is what I'm going to depend on. Change your vocabulary. That's why I'm here. Try to help you change your vocabulary. Providence. God sustaining and guiding human destiny. We prayed about some of your jobs here Tuesday night. Well, let me tell you, your job is in God's providence. Your career, your day. You keep knocking. That's why the Bible said knock shall be open. Seek, you'll find. Ask, be given. Amen. When, I, when I'm in my prayer clause, I'm praying. Why are you praying? Because of providence. Did you know that God will change his mind? You know the Bible says you can change God's mind? That God had a plan to keep you on this? Amen. And you prayed? And said, Lord, it's been too rough for too long. And you fasted and you prayed. And God, what did he do? He did not destroy Nineveh. He changed his mind. 
took him off to detour. Gave him smooth sailing. For another, another generation, until the next generation, backslid and God destroyed the whole city of Assyria. We one generation away, aren't we? Heads bowed, eyes closed. You can't hope your way to heaven. You can't take a chance to get to heaven. You got to say, God, forgive me of my sins. Be the providential ruler of my life. Remind me that everything that happens is God sent and God used. Amen. If you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, put your hand up right now. Up and down. Just throw it up in the air and put it back down. Thank you. Amen. That's all I need. That's a hand. That's two hands. Anyone else? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray this together with these hands that were lifted. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my future. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Write my name in the book of life. Prepare me. Use my tongue for the saving of many. Cleanse my heart. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God. Y'all all right? Everybody still love me? Flying out tomorrow for Utah. Be back Friday. Sister Lori's already there. Amen. Go up to see her. Her dad's 80. Nine years old. So Pop used to attend his church, said right over there. Loved you, loved the riches there. Amen. So he'll always ask about y'all when I see him. And he'll always tell me a joke that I can't tell in church. Amen. And, it, and we're getting old enough where I can tell him back to him, and he'll forget that he told me, so he'll laugh again. If you need to tie their offering envelope right in front of you on the pew, there is an offering envelope. You do God's will. God's way. God will favor you. Our tithe and offering is to honor God. If you're giving by phone, amen, go to holywild.net slash give. Those watching online, holywild.net slash Richard, if you're watching, holywild.net slash give. Amen. Everybody be a giver of your tithe and your offering. Amen to our guests. Thanks for coming today. Pray you enjoyed today. and uh, Come back, man. Come back. You know, this, this is a great house. Uh, now, I'm going to make one announcement as Pastor David comes, and that's the Beast Feast. On March the 5th, we're having a Beast Feast out at the ranch. Now, we have a full-service cafeteria. We're going to have breakfast that morning at 8 o'clock. We're going to have service right after. I was with Pastor David Hilton, Dayton Christian Center, yesterday. We're talking about this. We're going to give away a deer rifle for those 18 and up, 17 and down. I'll also get a pellet gun. Amen. They'll be, we'll be giving out raffle tickets for that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's by chance. Let's just call it hope. What? No, ma'am. Women are not allowed. This is for men. We are men, men, men. This ain't got nothing to do with women. Y'all had a meeting yesterday at the church. I wasn't invited to it. It was for the sis group. You got, you got uh, Sister Linda's group. So you, you women got stuff to do. You men got stuff to do. We're not, we not doing that. Charlie, you quit. Don't be stirring no water, starting no stuff. Amen. Do you want to swim with the men? Amen. That's between you and Jesus. But if you'd, like, if you'd like to come make tacos and serve, hallelujah. Martha's in the kitchen, sis. Martha's in the kitchen. Uh, you know, I mean that in all the kindness, Charlie, and I go way back. We may not have much of a future, but we do go way back. <laughs> Amen. Uh, this uh, quit. Guys, sign. how many of you men plan on being there? Lift your hand. I'm going to have a sign-up sheet next week. Men, I need you there. Amen. Because here's the thing. We have invited uh, Shiloh, which is a, uh, a rehab center for men who are getting reconnected back into the world after drugs, alcohol, and jail. Did you get hold of Kirk yet? We're going to try to invite another group, amen, to come up of young men. We, we just want to be able to mentor and love. This. There's going to be archery. There's going to be skeet shooting. There's going to be uh, horseshoes. There'll be basketball shoots, football throws. And there'll be things for the, all of us to do. But mainly, the big thing is about fellowship. We will have a a service that morning, uh, probably going to have a panel instead of just a regular. Uh, you know, I find the last thing most folk need is just more preaching. Amen. Sometimes people just need to ask questions and 
and have an opportunity to share with one another. Amen. So we want to be doing that. Uh, we'll have worship. We're going to give God honor. Amen. And every, everybody that wins is going to, you know I mean, the winners are going to get gifts. So uh, to remember the Beast Feast. And I need you to bring chili. It's a, it's a chili cook-off. You're going to get an award for the best chili. So, sir, ma'am, sister, if he don't cook chili, make it for him. And let him bring it. Amen. Uh, so, or, or teach him how. And here's the big question. It, does chili have beans in it? <laughs> Give it a 